record. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Sales Vitamin Podcast, where every every podcast, every episode is a vitamin for your professional sales development. And today you're going to get a bucket full of vitamins. We have the Director of Sales for North America of Life and Health Sciences, Mike Shadron on here. And uh, he is talking to us from Houston, Texas. And we are excited to have him on today. John, it's great to be on. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that, that my team especially appreciates the Sales Vitamin Podcast. I'm sure they get a lot more out of that than they do working with me. So um, it's really good to be on. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. Um, excited. We're going to talk about sales culture today. We're going to talk a little bit about a model that Mike uses called the Integral Model. And then he's also the author of Mike's Rules. 53 rules that uh, every sales professional can uh, use. And the reason I like uh, podcasts like today so much is because it's, we're talking to someone that's in the field, they're practical, they're selling, or they lead or manage a group of people much like myself. So it's very practical and very usable right now. So the vitamins are fixing to flow and they're fixing to start. Mike, give me a brief and give the least listeners just a brief description of where you're at right now and what you're doing. Cool. Um, I, I'm a native of the great state of Alabama. I'm an alum of Alabama, so roll tide, and I uh, tend to be pretty obnoxious about that. Uh, husband, father, grandfather, I uh, live in a suburb of the Houston area, and again, with uh, Underwriters Laboratories, uh, Life and Health Sciences, where I lead a team of uh, 14 people in North America, inside, outside, and sales operations people. So, you know, it's really a blessing. I'm getting to do what I love to do and I'm passionate about, and and uh, so really having a lot of fun. So again, it's, it's fun to be on here to share a little bit of that. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit just a, a, a few seconds ago about this integral model. Right. Tell me, tell me how that came about and, 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 and why the model and, and it's got four components to it, behavior, right. uh, systems, shared perceptions and intentions. Right. So, so let's talk about that. Okay. Well, it, one, it's, there's a, a really cool organization out of Austin, Texas called JMJ Associates. Uh, they do culture consulting. So I've done some work with them in the past and really good. So that's where we get the integral model from them. But, but it really goes back many years in working in sales and sales management. And, and what I found out is sales organizations tend to be really good in systems. I mean, if you think about it now, CRM get your, your forecast accurate, or you log in your activities, all of those things that, that companies tend to gravitate towards. So in the model, there's, it's four quadrants. The, on the right side is what they call the objective. So measurable, and then there's individual and group. So the individual is behavior. If you think about it, you can walk around with a clipboard and see what people are doing and judge their behavior. You don't even have to talk to them. Right. From the group standpoint, it's, it's systems and policies and procedures. And let's face it, in sales, we're really good at that. I mean, our, you know, everything's got to be important. What I have found in my career, what tends to be missing, though, is the subjective, the, the culture and the, the, in, the individual intention side. So the model says that you're only as good as your, your least developed quadrant. So what I found in, in my experience is, Again, very good in systems, pretty good in behavior, terrible on culture. And, and to me, the culture is every bit as important as the systems and the behavior. So, so what I found was you can have the greatest systems in the world. If your culture stinks, you're not going to reach high performance. And, and even the opposite, you have a great culture. If your systems are bad, you won't reach high performance. So, so it's, it's a different angle to look at the, the leadership of, of sales organizations and creating that positive winning culture. So I use the model um, that helps me and it helps our team seem to show that, that we're at work on the culture. And you know, I've been here a year and a half and what's cool is, is to see how the culture has improved, but not just within sales, throughout the whole organization. So it's, it's really good to see that. I'm, I'm lucky to work for some great leaders that understand culture is important. And so, we, you know, working towards creating a high-performing culture, uh, I would make the argument that if you'll go to work on culture, you will see results almost immediately. And, and, and we've, we've, we've seen that, and the performance is pretty good, and um, really turning into a high-performing team, which is fun. So, in your experience, if you're 
uh, working with a group, are you, and you're coming in, so you, you came into a new group. Yep. Would you focus on the culture first or the skills and the technical things from a sales professional standpoint? Yes. Um, so when, when I came in, really all of it. So when I came into to UL, um, they, in my division, they had gone through like four sales managers in five years. I mean, just chewed them up and spit them out. Yeah. And um, so the first thing I had to come in and do was really create relationships and trust. A, a mentor told me one time, look, when you go into a new role, they're going to say, oh, you be a change agent, go in there and scorched earth, resist it. What you need to do is go in, listen, develop relationships, develop trust. And then when you do make changes, you'll come at it from a part of a point of, of strength of relationship, not just, well, here's a new guy making changes. So when I got to UL, what I found was we had a lot of the wrong people in the wrong roles doing the wrong things. So right off the bat, I realized we had to do some changes there. But just as importantly is we were not aligned with operations, which we call engineering and right. sales through no fault of either ones. But I knew immediately we had to create alignment within the organization and then start to upgrade our, our performance by getting the right people in. So we've had 60% turnover in sales. Um, the people that, that aren't here anymore are not bad people. They were right. just in the wrong role. It, right. Probably akin to me being in accounting. Yeah. It wouldn't, wouldn't be a good idea. So, so we, we came in and we developed rapport and, and alignment with operations immediately. One thing that, that, that we did was we recommended that, that everyone read uh, Jopko um, Wilnick's um, book about extreme ownership. Yes, absolutely. And, and which is wonderful. And what's funny is I recommended it to the engineering leaders. So they made all the engineers in North America read it. So I started getting emails from number one, thanks a lot, dummy, you know, yeah. making us read this book. And number yeah. two, didn't know the sales guy could even read, <laughs> but, but then they, they got a lot out of it. They were doing weekly calls on the, the chapters. So that really helped us right off the bat. And then to come in, evaluate and start to make some changes and, and we're able to, to upgrade, you know, 60% of our sales team. So it's funny in, in September, uh, we had an amazing month and we were 48% over last year, which was pre COVID and, and, um, 60% of my team have been here less than a year. So like I told our VP, we're just getting started. Yeah. And a lot of that is being intentional around the culture. The systems were important, but they were pretty well in place, but creating alignment and, and creating a, a real positive culture, um, of high performance you know, that's just where the, the team is worth more than the sum of the parts. Right. And, and we went to work deliberately on that and, and to see the team pull for each other. It's just really a lot of fun. And I give credit to the team uh, for that. So it's been quite an adventure. Um, but, but I think we're making some, some pretty good headway and, and, and working on the culture does that. Yeah. What are some of the, if I said, hey, Mike, what are the two or three key pieces of when you come into a culture of creating it, creating that positive sales culture that obviously is going to lead to, you know, results? Yep. What are those two or three key things that you kind of looked at? The, the first thing has got to be um, uh, integrity and trust in relationships. You've got to build trust with the stakeholders and also the member of the team. Because otherwise, hey, you know what? I was here before Mike got here. I'll be here after he's gone. You can't do that. You've got to say, look, my success is predicated on yours. So I'm committed to your success. And, and, this, is, and this is what it's going to look like. I had my top performer came to me a month into the job. And he said, you know, I'm going to go to work for one of the other divisions. And, and he wanted me to beg him to stay. And I didn't. I said, look, you know, if, if you want to go, I'll help you. You know, I'm not going to hold anybody back. But I want you to listen to our vision. Here's what we're going to do. And here's what I see you doing in it. And to his credit, he bought in. And he didn't know me from Adam. Yeah. But he bought into it. And so this year, he's done triple what he did last year. Just uh, he's the, the best, the, the top performing salesperson in the world in life and health sciences for UL. So it's really cool to see that. But that started from trust. He had to learn to trust me, that I had to trust him, that, that I had his best interest at heart. And, and his good performance would benefit the team. And, you know, and here we are a year and three months later, 
wow, you know, he's just destroying it. And I think that just came from the fact to just get him in the, in the right role, doing the right things. What can I do to support you? But that all came from trust. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is I think you've got to build alignment with the stakeholders. So in our case, it was the engineering managers that have dealt with, you know, a bunch of mics over time to develop trust with them. And, um, and, and the rules helped with that, but also the work at culture and just showing up. Um, my predecessor had not gone to a single lab in two years. I made it a point to go to every one of our labs every month for the first year until we stopped yeah. traveling just to show up and be there and, and listen to them. And I think has really been helpful. So um, I think the main thing is just build a trusting relationship. No kidding. Yeah. And then, um, and then establish r really powerful relationships within the stakeholders. And if you do that, then, then you can build on that and make some magic happen. And it, and, and I agree. I mean, the trust and the alignment from a sales management standpoint, when you look at all the salespeople in your career that you've dealt with and that you've worked with, and even now, yep. what separates the ones that are good and that get it versus the ones that maybe aren't as good? What are the key sales professional just day in and day out things that, that make those, those sales professionals what they are? That, that's a great question. I think to me, it's just got to be that they're just relentless that they're just, they use the velvet hammer, you know, and they're polite and are solving their customers problems, but just relentless. Um, and it doesn't matter, you know, male, female, old, young, doesn't matter. They just got to have that internal drive and, um, and, and just commit to success. That's the thing is just to be driven to solve customer problems and to succeed. And, and, and just proceed from there. And then the other thing is, you know, they don't take things personally. You know, sales can be hard. Yeah. So, you know what? Okay, so that's a no. Let's get to the next yes. And, and just be relentless. So, you know, there's no magic bullet. You yeah. know, it comes down to just hard work, but, but being good at it too. So, um, pleasantly relentless is something we talk about a lot on the team. It is to be is pleasantly relentless. Yeah. What are some things that you've seen or even that you do right now from a personal development standpoint or professional sales development standpoint that you encourage your team to do to yep. stay to stay because it is a sales profession. Right. You know, and that's mentally that's part of the battle itself. Well, what do you what do you teach in your team and, and, and things like that? Well, I think, I think that's exactly it. it is a, it is a professional business and you've got to improve every day. You know, uh, coach Nick Saban says every day is different. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. There is no status quo. So that's what we've challenged the team with. So, so instead of throwing a lot of, of sales training at them, and there's a lot of really good sales training, we have really focused more on what we can do together to get better. So for example, when we do our every other week sales call, we do a session called what's working. And that's where one of the team lays out something that's working for them. And then we learn from it. And then, and then from there, we, we spend a lot of time in their, in their development, both in one-on-ones and during those sales conversation of product knowledge, but also selling skills. Cause we've got a wide array. I've got one guy that's been here 29 years and I got inside salespeople that, that have been here less than a year. So it's, it's, it's a wide range of development. So it's recognizing what each one needs, but something even the team came up with, we, um, did an employee engagement school uh, survey earlier this year, all of UL, and our team had among the highest engagement scores in the company, but they didn't rest on that. So what coming out of that, they came up with three things they want to do, and it is onboarding, um, career path, and sales training, and they're developing it on their own. They don't need Mike to tell them that. I just kind of say, yeah, you're good, yeah. and go from there. So the, so, the, so the far as the development is having them own it, and right. realize it not because Mike says, okay, we got to go do sales training Boy. and they feel a part of it. Like they are. They, and they, they, they buy in, they, they own it. We did a kickoff meeting in Austin last January where we talked about culture and we, we committed to each other on um, that. We were going to, to have a successful year. And, and they'll tell you now that was a transformative event. 
that everybody bought in that we're going to succeed. So the main thing is that they've got to have ownership to improve themselves. And then you know, we make sure they're reading, they're listening to these podcasts. Um, yours and some others are really good. Uh, we've had everybody read um, Selling from the Heart by Larry yes, Levine. And we're absolutely. big fans of Larry. The very and, first um, guest on the Sales Vitamin it, Podcast. Larry's just terrific. And, and he'll be speaking to our group even, even more moving forward. So, you know, the main thing is just for them to take ownership of it. And something as simple as the other day, we always have a theme for our sales meetings. Like, you know, what's your Halloween costume or what? A few weeks ago it was, who is the first person you voted for for president? Don't need to know who you're doing now. But who's first? So like guys like me, Reagan, a long time ago, all the way to one of our ladies that said um, Obama the second time because I wasn't old enough to vote the first time. So what we said was, look, it doesn't matter who you vote for. Go vote. And we had four or five that had never voted before and, and that could have. So the last few days, we're, we're, we've got a nice chat going, okay, so did, how long did it take you to, to vote early? And it's just the team really caring about one another and just committed to each other's success. Um, there's a word called mudita. And, and what it means is um, relish, you know, relishing in the success of others. And that's really what we do. So my top performer that I mentioned to you, he's the best guy with our quote tool. He helps people all the time with the quote tool, even will help himself and doesn't get credit for it. He's a good team member. Yeah. So that's the thing, the, the culture that we've been at work on is just having everybody buy in that we're doing something special here and we're helping companies, you know, get products to market that can help with COVID. Um, it's, it's a good calling yeah. and everybody believes in it. And then on top of that, to see in success um, and, and, you know, and people, I mean, we just did our, our quarterly SIP payments and that's the best day of the year for me. Yeah. Um, uh, the quarter to request those, those payments to, to reward them for some, some hard work. So, um, you know, it's just, it, it's nothing magical. It's just hard work, but a little bit of common sense and caring about people instead of just, well, you didn't make $120 today. What the heck? Big yeah. Deal. Yeah. Big deal. Just, you know, get it done and tell us what you need to succeed. So um, it's fun to see it come. It's a work in progress. We still yeah. got a ways to go. It's a, des it's a journey, not a destination. What are some of the, the couple of things that you've seen change over, you, over the years in the sales profession? And where do you see the sales profession going from right now? Um, you know, the Apostle Paul says there's nothing new under the sun. Um, sales is still very much a relationship uh, solving customers' problems. You know, so back when Mike was carrying a bag in 1985, still those same type of relationships. So I think the biggest change has been technology. You know, if COVID had happened right now, I got out of college and I'm, I'm carrying a bag around, um, probably would have been challenging, but now we've got zoom, we've got teams, we can continue on. So I think the technology and not working off of note cards, but having a good CRM to be organized and, and instant communication, that type of thing, as opposed to you know, getting off the airplane and running to the phone bank. Right. You know, to check voicemail. So this is just, I guess the instant communication is what I've seen. Um, where I see the, the professional sales profession going is that it becomes an even more and more respected profession um, because it's critical for professional salespeople out there and, and products and services are being so much, so more comp, much complicated that it's still important to have smart, hardworking, caring people that can cut through the, the noise for the customer and solve their problems and, and make complex situations as simple as possible in a day. So, so, you know, so again, the difference is, you know, iPhones and, and, and CRM and Zoom and team and, and, the, and the, the benefit moving forward is, is that this, this profession is always going to be needed. Yeah. And uh, for people that, that have a heart for it. So, um, you know, I, whenever I, I have to introduce myself to people, I tell them all the time, I'm a sales guy. Yeah. And I'm really proud of that. Yeah. And I think that's where we've got to continue. So the good work you're doing and, and Larry and John and all the others out there, it's just important that we continue to put the focus that, you know, this is a great career. 
yeah. uh, for people, it, it, even with or without a degree or anything. You can you can have a really great career and make an impact in people and companies' lives, uh, as well as your own in sales. Yeah, uh, I recently read uh, Daniel Pink's "To Sell as Human." You you've probably read it or seen it. But, yeah, uh, it's been a while. It, yeah, I have. It's probably one of the better sales books. But he talks in there about everybody's in sales. You know, you're <laughs> yeah, you're selling something <laughs> at, at all times. So. What would you tell that, that, that young guy coming out of college or somebody looking to transition out of a different field? What would you tell them about being a sales professional? The first thing I would tell them is I'd ask them is why do you want to get into it? Because if the answer is money, it's the wrong reason. Because, you know, you've got people that are purely for the money and they end up being C players or, or miserable and moving on. You know, it's got to be someone who really enjoys the challenge of, um, of solving problems. I think that's the main thing. So, you know, so some of the best salespeople I know you are, have, are people that come from what they're selling into. So, you know, one of my top sales guys is an engineer yeah. and he did medical device testing before he became a salesperson into the medical device space and he understands it. So I would just say if, if you're passionate about people, and about solving problems for customers uh, in an innovative way, then sales is for you. If you're doing it just for the for this, you probably ought to do a checkup from the neck up. To quote, you know, Zig Ziglar. Yeah. Um, that's it's the wrong reason. So that would be my advice. Why? And then if you can really look in the mirror and answer it, why? Then I think then I think you're off to a good start. It, it's not easy. It's it's hard. Yeah. Um, the other advice would be make sure you go somewhere where you can get some some good coaching. I, I have I have recommended brand new people want to get into sales, go to someplace like an ADP or a Granger or someplace that's got a really good sales development thing. So you can kind of learn about it. You'll, you'll learn the pound of flesh they're going to get out of you um, and, and go from there. And then, you know, then your next two or three, your next two moves, you'll probably get to where you want to be. So yeah, anyway, that's, that's what, what I would tell them if they, if they came to, to Mike, I tell my team all the time, I got several of them. I said, you know, my top sales guy said, you know, you, you remind me of a 32 year old Mike and that should terrify you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and Mike wasn't that high performing of, as this guy, but, but the point is you can kind of see it. And as the great philosopher, Toby Keith said, I, you know, I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think that's the thing. So that's where, you know, through my LinkedIn post and, and my rules and, and, and these type of things, it's trying to give back because yeah. this, this profession has been really good to me and yeah. I'd like to give a little bit back to it. Yeah. And talking about Mike's rules. So let's talk about some of the rules. We're not going to talk about all of them, but I think there's some here and, uh, that are really, really cool. And, uh, the first one I saw, the learn the man in the arena speech. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, talk to me about that a little bit. So, so th there's another rule that says Teddy Roosevelt is the man. So those of you who <laughs> yeah. have not, I'm a big history guy, and Teddy Roosevelt was, was larger than life. But in, in 1909, 1910, at the Sorbonne in Paris, he gave a speech called the man in the arena. And basically, I, I can't recite it completely. I've got it over here somewhere. But, you know, he ends up saying, um, unlike those cold and timid souls who've known neither victory nor defeat. You know, it's the man with the dust and the mud and the blood yeah. on your, you're in the arena. And, you know, that's our motto in our sales team is, you know, be in the arena. It's not easy. But wow, it's just so rewarding. So, so the, if you don't know the, the man in the arena speech, Google it. Uh, and it's fantastic. And in fact, when I go to Paris, uh, I always have to go over to the Sorbonne and, and yeah. see, well, this is where Teddy was. And it's right across from the, the, the Notre Dame Cathedral. So, um, you know, that's really important too. And, and but it also gets to the, the rule there is, is we need to understand history and learn from good leaders. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. way too narrow in my focus, but I tend to read more about great leaders than I do professional sales. And I, I should probably work on that. But wow, when you, when you read about a Teddy Roosevelt a Winston Churchill, a Ronald Reagan, you learn a lot. Yeah. Great leaders and what they did. And so I get a lot out of, out of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, you know, one of my, my favorite things is, you know, I'll ask the team yes or no. Okay. Teddy says yes. <laughs> and, um, and to go with, with TR, I even dressed up like him on Halloween a few years ago and the team got a little picture 
of yeah. it last week. So um, I think I think that's important. But it's also just as you improve yourself, read, listen to podcasts, you know, get better at it. And it doesn't have to be sales books. You right. can learn a lot of different things. So th- that's that's the Teddy Roosevelt stuff. And, and the team laughs at me, but Teddy's the man. No, that's great stuff. Uh, one of your other rules here, after two emails, pick up the phone. And I think this is, I want you to expound on that, but it goes back to what you were talking about. We got all kinds of gadgets and we got all yep. kinds of things, but the, the, the phone yep. is still, I think, the best one. Absolutely. So, so this one just came about. I mean, we've all seen the email strings that you have to scroll for 30 minutes to see it all. And, you know, I'm going to the next shiny object. I don't have the patience for that. And um, so after that started to happen a lot, and on top of that, reply all, which is from the devil, uh, comes into there too. Yeah. So um, so it's just been something I've done for probably 10 years is just said without even writing it down. Okay, two emails. Pick up the phone. Yeah. You know, the funny thing about it is I knew I was on to something. When I'm walking through the halls of headquarters in, in Northbrook, Illinois, and I heard one of our engineers go, Rule 16, that's more than two emails, call me. Yeah. Um, and I knew we were on to something. So it's just kind of practical. But, you know, the, you hit on it. The, the thing that it does is it makes us talk to one another. You know, people get email courage or, you know, one thing I tell my sales team all the time, I don't do subliminal. I'm not smart enough. So if you think you see, you're, you're reading something into an email that I don't say, call me. Because I probably don't. I'm not smart enough to do subliminal in an yeah. email. And, and I've had, had them coming for, are you mad at me? No, you'll know if I am. And, and just <laughs> yeah. and talk about it. So I think what that does is it just encourages that, that human connection that's so easy to get away from. And, you know, and, you know, with emails and texts and instant messages and all that stuff, which is all wonderful. You can't get away from the human connection. And yeah. a lot of times a three minute phone call will solve a 30 string email just to align. So I think you've got to have those relationships where you can call a guy and go, Hey, our, our lady, what the heck, what do you mean here? Boom. You get it solved. So yeah. that's kind of a fetish of mine is that pick up the daggum phone. Yeah. And it works pretty well. Oh yeah. And then another one, it's your last rule. It probably could be your first. Um, yep prospecting is like shaving and you got to do it every day. The, I had a, this episode's coming out later. It's a lady from behavioral sciences, but it's all about call reluctance and the science over 40 years of research that was done about call reluctance mm-hmm. and why people are scared to whether it's prospecting or yep. networking or whatever. But I, I find that, you know, prospecting is so yep. important. And I don't think it's like, like you said earlier, it's not about going out and making 150 calls and saying, boy, I made 150 calls. I did a lot of right. prospecting. No, you didn't do anything. Right. You know, but that's a great point. That last, that rule. You know, my, my buddy, Jeff Farrington, um, who is the head football coach at North Greenville University in Greenville, South Carolina, told me this one when he was at East Tennessee State 25 years ago. And I remember talking to him. We'd go to breakfast and do Bible study every Saturday, every Friday morning. And he said, oh, I got to go. I got to go see some, some kids at high school. And he told me, he said, because recruiting is like shaving. I got to do it every day or I'm a bum. And so I just took Jeff's really good idea and made it prospecting. So, you know, we, yeah. we do that. And the other thing we do is, is we tell our sales team, do the most difficult thing first thing in the morning. Do your prospecting in the morning. Knock it out. 8 to 9.30, whether it's following up on leads or, or, or you know, or, or just cold calling or campaigns, whatever, get in, do it, knock it out, and then go to the fun part, quotes and closing yeah. the rest of the day. But look, if you, don't, if, you, if you don't have a passion for the prospecting, you're not going to have success in sales. It's not going to just walk up and bite you. You got to go get it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and the fun thing is, is, is you see the different personalities of salespeople, but almost all successful ones um, enjoy the hunt as much as the kill. Yeah. But I mean, it's really cool to say, you know, you take something from here to, wow, you know, we, we, we're solving that problem. We got it now. So anyway, that, I, that's, that's really important um, that we, that we do that. And there's some, you know, there's some others on here that are kind of personal because I didn't know these were going to get a life of their own. So, yeah. you know, big deal, roll tide gets my attention. Um, <laughs> but, but we, so we have some fun, some fun ones on there too, but yeah. you know, there's one that, that sort of came from my mother 
that, you know, that, that she used to email me and then, and then call me and tell me I had an email. So now I tell people if, if it's important, text me and say, you know, email. And I go look at the email. They know it's important just because of the sheer volume that we, that we yeah. get. So again, it's just, it's kind of got a life of its own and, and it's getting, and we're having some fun with it. So now even yeah. my counterparts in other divisions are like, send me the rules. So, uh, yeah. so it, it really is a lot of fun uh, with them too. So, you know, there's a little personality sprinkled in there with them. And, yeah. uh, and I think it's helped bring the team together. No, they're all great. And uh, so I've got one more question for you, sure. but before we answer that question, um, the first, first question, question for you is who wins the sec okay so um, that's that's question number one who wins the okay. sec probably in a year where it's the toughest 10 conference yeah. game schedule and would throw oh, everything brutal. else in the mix so whoever brutal. wins it's right. gonna have a great shot at it so tell me that right. and then tell all the listeners where they can get a hold of you what's the best way to contact you and get in touch with you Okay, so number one, I am not an objective source for that question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I Bear Bryant was at Alabama. I met my bride there. So, you know, I, it's, it's going to be the tide. I think we're looking pretty good. Uh, Ten games, it's pretty rough. So, uh, so we'll see all in conference. But, but I think, you know, the, the nice thing about Nick Saban is he doesn't rebuild, he reloads. And yeah. uh, a lot of talent there. So, it's going to go away some point. I'm just going to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, because a little longer than I thought. Um, the second part is you can get in touch with me on LinkedIn. I'm a big LinkedIn guy. Um, Mike Chaudron, C-H-A-U-D-R-O-N on LinkedIn. Or you can reach me at, at my UL email address, Chaudron at ul.com. Would love to hear from you. Um, I know that, that when, we, when I posted my rules, I had about, I think roughly 300 new connection requests and people are asking for them. Happy to send them. And they're also on my LinkedIn profile. Okay, cool. So they can get them right there. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Um, so the last question is you've got one sales vitamin to give today. Right. What's that one sales vitamin that you want to leave the listeners with? Um, I've, I've thought about this one a lot. <laughs> and um, so actually it, it may seem really simple, but despite what people say, sales is not a numbers game. It's a quality game. So numbers don't mean anything like you've referenced earlier about smiling and dialing for 150 big deal. You yeah. know, give me, give me 15 really quality phone calls that you've done your research on and you're, and you're helping solve problems instead of just, you know, smiling and dialing. So, so my sales vitamin sales is not a numbers game. Okay. So sales is not a numbers game. Good. It is no, not. I think it's a you're quality right. game. Yeah. I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, short of being in some type of role, I wouldn't even call it a sales role. It's very transactional. Right. It, 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 you may need to do a lot of that, but uh, right. from a professional C level, you know, yep. I think you're dead on. I think you're exactly right. Yep. Well, you know, I tell people all the time there, uh, sometimes the gray hair comes in handy. Yeah, and uh, right. so, so 32 year old Mike probably didn't understand that. Yeah. So um, it's a, it's a way of giving a little bit back. So, uh, so yeah. it's not a numbers game. Well, Mike, man, it's been great having you on. I know the listeners are going to get a ton out of this. I encourage all of you listeners to get to uh, his uh, LinkedIn page, get these, get these rules, connect with, with Mike and uh, commend Mike on his, just your service, the years you've been over 30 years, what you've done for the sales profession is fantastic. Um, you're an SEC fan, so I kind of like that as well. I'm an SEC You know, fan. At, at, that's, that's the only real football that's played. <laughs> yeah. um, come at me, Big Ten, <laughs> um, from that, because I got a bunch of friends up there. But, John, thank you for what you do. Thank you for having me on. You know, it's, it's a blessing to be able to give just a little bit back to a profession that's been so good to me, and it's a lot of fun. So I, I hope your listeners get a little something out of this. Um, it's certainly been a lot of fun being with you. No, they will. We Certainly appreciate having you on. I look forward to uh, releasing this and letting everybody enjoy it. Perfect. Very good. Thanks.